Hi, thanks for listening to today's message from Calvary in Lake Havasu. The fruitful living study of Galatians continues today with a message about kindness. We are still focused on Galatians chapter 5, and the Life Notes are available now to download from calvaryaz.com forward slash Life Notes. Now, let's hear from the pastor. I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 is our text, and if you are in the room at one of our campuses and you don't have a Bible and uh, you want to follow along with us, then uh, grab one of those Bibles in the seats or around you at Sweetwater or at Parker Campus and turn to page 1,158, and you'll be able to find Galatians chapter 5. You'll be able to follow along with us as we look at the text. And as always, if you're at one of our campuses and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then please take one. It's our gift to you. We want you to have God's Word, read God's Word, because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. If you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible and you want one, just ask. We will get you one, again, because we want you to have and read and apply God's Word. So uh, how many people in this room, how many people in the room are siblings? Okay, you got, you got brothers or sisters. Okay, a lot of hands going up. Good. All right, how many had a mean older sibling? Okay, how many were the mean older sibling? Okay, that's pretty much everyone raised their hand on that one. You know, you either had one or uh, you were one. So I have three brothers. Two of them are older than I am. And uh, can I just put it this way? The oldest brother when I was growing up was mean. I mean, he's the kind of brother that would hit me for no reason. I guess there was a reason I existed. So, uh, you know, my very existence just annoyed him. And, uh, you know, I wondered every single day of my childhood, was this going to be my last day? Uh, because this, was this the day he was going to kill me and it would all be over? And, and you know, so I was, uh, I was, I understood growing up what mean was because it, it you know, and I got stories I could tell you. But, uh, so I understand meanness intimately. Now, thankfully, God redeems because uh, my oldest brother and I are good friends today. Uh, God has changed uh, his life and our relationship, and he's been very kind to me as an adult. So uh, I, I do have to say that because he might watch this. But, uh, <laughs> but today, as we continue our study, we're, you know, in Galatians, we're still talking about the fruit of the Holy Spirit, Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23, and hopefully you've memorized it by now. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. So uh, I mean, that's our text. We've been looking at this. Uh, this is the uh, you know, fourth week, and we've, we've talked about the, the, the big three already, or four, love, joy, peace, patience. Yeah, so we're in the fifth week. I, <laughs> I've been traveling. Uh, but here's the thing. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus actually is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins, and you, were ra- you believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then God the Holy Spirit inhabits you. Okay, the moment you confess Jesus as Lord, he moved in, claimed you for Jesus, and started that whole teaching, convicting, comforting, and guaranteeing your, your salvation. And he's teaching you these characteristics. Okay, this is what the Holy Spirit is doing in our lives. He's saying, hey, I want you to learn how to love. I want you to have joy. I'm going to teach you how to do that. I want you to have patience. I want you to be faithful. And I'm going to teach you these characteristics. And so today we're talking about kindness. Now, my observation from growing up in church is that kindness doesn't get much respect, okay? It's not the, one of the big three, you know, love, joy, peace. It's not one of the ones that everybody wants to avoid, like patience or self-control. It's just a nice afterthought. Oh, yeah, kindness. We just kind of overlook it, ignore it, undervalue it. And the interesting thing is it's evident if you visit a lot of churches, you know, if you visit a lot of churches, people aren't really naturally all that kind. Um, you know, I, I'm an expert on meanness, so uh, I'll weigh in on it. And there's a lot of mean people in churches. You know, and, and that always, I didn't understand it. You know, it was, it was kind of one of those things that growing up, I kind of thought, why is it this way? Shouldn't we be happy because of Jesus and his love and all this kind of stuff? And, and, but there's a lot of mean people in churches, and a lot of them, unfortunately, tragically, are in leadership. And I know it's because it's easier to talk about God's Word than it is to apply it. 
And if we don't value it, then we're not going to do it. But that leads us to a place of powerlessness and hypocrisy, which is not a winning combination for church, and it's definitely not Jesus. So today, I, I just want to begin by talking about a theology of kindness. A theology of kindness. Uh, you know, why do we emphasize kindness? Why is it important? Why is the Holy Spirit trying to teach us kindness? And, uh, and, and I want you to know that God is kind even when you can't see it or feel it. Okay, let me say that again. God is kind always even when you can't see it or feel it. Um, you know, we sing songs about how he's never going to let us down, or we sing songs that say you are good. Uh, but what about when God doesn't answer our prayers? Doesn't feel so kind, right? You need money. And so you're praying, God, let me win the lottery. You're praying, God, let me get a, you know, get a raise at my work, or God, let me get a job so I can take care of my family. And, and, and it doesn't happen. Or you're praying, God, I want you to heal my child because they're, they're sick, they're not well, and you're asking for God to, to answer your prayer, and, and he doesn't. Or you prayed for your marriage, that God, please restore my marriage, heal my marriage. I want it to work, but it ended anyway. And in those moments, it's difficult to feel and sometimes to even understand God's kindness. Or maybe you haven't had those things happen, but you just wonder, why do bad things happen to good people? I mean, we look around this world and we hear about these tragedies, these accidents, these things. And we go, that, that doesn't seem very good. That doesn't seem very kind. So how do we answer that based on God's kindness? And that's why I want to share a theology of kindness. Because kindness reflects the character of Jesus. Okay? Now, by the way, in case you've missed out on this, Jesus is God the Son. We talk about Son of God, Savior of the world, but he's actually eternal. He is part of the, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's God the Son. So when we see Jesus, we see the Father. That's what Jesus said in the Gospel of John. You've seen me, you've seen the Father. So when we look at Jesus, we understand who God is. And I want you to, to hear what uh, the Apostle Paul says in the book of Ephesians. By the way, if you have one of these Bibles, you don't even have to turn the page. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at verse 4. And Paul says... But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him, with Jesus, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages God might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus." For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one should boast. So God is righteous, God is judge, and God is kind. And under the law, which is all about justice, by the way, under the law, we get what we deserve. We choose disobedience. God's righteousness demands wrath. Okay, that's how that works. That's how the law works. You, you know, uh, so wrath means that, you know, we deserve punishment, pain, death, and hell. And you see this personified in the Old Testament. If you guys read the Old Testament, which I encourage you to do, if you're reading through the Bible in a year, you're reading the, you know, the Old Testament, you're probably getting close uh, to the end of it. But, but you read the Old Testament, and here was, the, here was the setup. God made a covenant with Israel as a nation. And he said, if you obey me, I'm going to bless the, your socks off. Okay. Not exactly the quote. Okay. But I'm going to bless you, you know, immensely. And he tells them all the ways he's going to bless them. He says, by the way, but if you, if you disobey me, there's going to be curses that come your way. There's going to be famines and pestilence and you're going to get conquered. You're going to get killed and all this bad stuff's going to happen. And, and, and then, you know, God said, what do you want to do? And they said, we want to, we want to serve God. We're going to, and so they said yes to the, the whole deal. And then, do you, do you think they followed the, the, you know, covenant? Do you think they followed the law? No. I mean, they ridiculously disobeyed it over and over and over again. And they suffered the consequences of their actions. They got what they deserved because it was the justice part of the covenant. So this was under the law. And, and because they disobeyed hor horrifically, they suffered horrifically. And then Jesus came. And he established a new covenant. And it's the covenant of grace, not law. And under grace, we get better than we deserve. 
So we choose Jesus and we receive blessings, life, and heaven, not because we're good people, not because we keep the law, but because we said yes to grace and now we get heaven instead of hell. We get mercy instead of judgment. And it's all because of mercy. So in case you missed it, we live in a sin-filled world of death, okay? All people sin, so all people deserve what? Death. All people sin, so all people deserve hell. By the way, theologically, since we're talking theologically, there are no good people. There are no innocent people. Some of you are looking around going, do you just mean I'm guilty? Yes, you're guilty. Sorry, look at the person next to you and say, you're guilty, sorry. You know, but we are. They, you know, and so it's a misnomer to say, oh, why do bad things happen to good people? Well, they don't. They, you know, bad things happen because we're all sinners and we live in a world that is filled with sin and death. And, and the consequences of that, according to justice, according to God's righteousness, is wrath and judgment. But if you're a follower of Jesus, no matter what happens in your life, good or bad, whether your prayers are answered or not, you are getting better than you deserve. Okay, by the way, it's way better. It's not just like a little bit better. It is way better because we deserve hell, but we get to go to heaven. We deserve punishment, but we get blessings. We deserve to be cast out, yet we are adopted by God into his family and made joint heirs with Jesus. That's insane, and that's God's kindness that comes to all of us who claim Jesus. Now, does that make sense to you? Okay, that's a little bit of theology of kindness. We're not done with it. But kindness is the character of Jesus, and kindness is central to the mission. Okay? Uh, you know Jesus' mission. He came to seek and to save the lost. You know Calvary's mission. If you're new here, you don't. Our mission is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus, and kindness is really central to this mission. Uh, one of our core values here at Calvary is radical service. We believe followers of Jesus best demonstrate love to others by acts of kindness and service. That's why we do all the service projects because that's serving together. But our acts of kindness uh, are, are a powerful statement of the truth and reality of the gospel. That's why we do the things that we do. That's why we encourage you to do the things that we would do. But what that means is we do not believe that there's any place in the family of God for jerks for Jesus. Okay, I don't know if you've ever met any of them. They don't usually wear t-shirts. They don't usually have a badge saying I'm a jerk for Jesus, but you've met them, right? There are these people who, who are so uh, you know, arrogant and so uh, angry and so self-righteous that they misrepresent the gospel, they misrepresent Jesus, and they do it in the name of Jesus. And if you're around them, you would just apologize for them or rebuke them. That's generally what I tend to do. But, um, but see, here's the thing. You can't talk about Jesus. You can't share the truth of the gospel and treat people like garbage. You can't do that. Kindness means we tell the truth. We tell it with compassion and care, not callousness and disrespect. And I've seen people who just, you know, shred other people, treat them like, like they're trash, and they do it in the name of, well, I told them the truth about Jesus. No, you just, you represented a lie about Jesus because Jesus cares about those people. And understand, this is core to our mission, that when we walk out these doors, that we are kind we're kind to our family. It needs to start there. If you're kind to everyone else and not your family, you're failing. We're kind to our family. We're kind to our friends. We're kind to the wait staff who's going to take care of you at the restaurant. You're kind to the workers at the DMV. Yes, really. <laughs> See, this is the difference maker in our mission. It means that you're kind to your child's teacher, even if you don't agree with them on your child's progress. It means you're kind to your child's coaches, even if they don't know how to coach. It means you're kind to the umpires at the games. Do I need to say that one again? Because I only got one amen out of this whole room. <laughs> See, I mean, and, and a lot of times we don't think about how we're representing Jesus because emotionally we're so attached to, to trying to promote our child or promote our idea that we forget that we are always to be kind because love is patient and love is kind. And we cannot represent Jesus unless we reflect his character. And so if you are a jerk for Jesus, you're hurting the mission because you're not representing Jesus. 
So finally, on our theological reflection about kindness, can I just also remind us that kindness flows from humility? Philippians chapter two, verse uh, three and four, the apostle Paul says, do nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit, but rather with humility of mind, consider others more important than yourselves. Do not merely look after your own interests, but also the interests of others. So kindness flows from humility. I'm just gonna tell you meanness flows from selfishness and arrogance. See, we get mean and treat people with disrespect because we're self-centered. It's all about our needs, our wants, our agenda, our plans. You're not worried or thinking about others because you are self-consumed. And that makes you mean. Selfishness makes you mean. The other thing that makes you mean is arrogant. Arrogance. We get mean because we're arrogant. And in arrogance, we actually believe that we are more important than others. Now, we'd never say it. We just act like it. We never promote the idea, but we live that out. And, and, it, and I'm just going to say, meanness can flow out of that law justice mindset. Because in that law mindset, that religious mindset, remember the one that Paul's been attacking for most of the, uh, the book of Galatians? You know, we convince ourselves that we are the good people and others are the bad people. We convince ourselves that we're the good people and others are less good. And so we have a right to expect more and better a- instead of them. Because we're, and, and we think incorrectly, that we're more loved and more blessed by God than they are. And that's incredibly faulty thinking that leads us to be unkind. Kindness flows from the humility of knowing what we deserve and the reality that we get better because of God's grace. And because of that, we look at other people and we treat them with kindness too because they are valuable. And so we put their needs on par with our needs, not ours ahead of them. So, Hopefully that provides all of us with a little bit of a theological understanding for kindness because the Holy Spirit wants to teach us kindness. So how can we improve in being kind? Let me share with you keys to kindness. Uh, I wanna share with you just uh, some three things that if you wanna grow in goodness, these will impact your life. Uh, I wanna challenge you to embrace these three practices. And, And really they're more about how you think uh, that results in what you do as much as in what you do. Okay, so uh, they're going to lead you to a kinder life. So three things. First of all, recognize the image of God in others. Recognize the image of God in others. Genesis 1.27 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, um, we love to quote, quote that if we're arguing with people about genders and things like that. Uh, and and uh, at the same time, that should change how we see people. Because if you believe that people are made in the image of God, it affects how you treat them. Do you guys believe that people are made in the image of God? Then it should affect how we treat them. Uh, See, that means that all people are valuable simply because God created them in his image. Whether they are, you know, pre-born infants to the oldest of the old, they're valuable because they're made in the image of God. Whether they are people who are healthy, wealthy, and successful, or people who are infirm, poor, and abandoned, all people are created in God's image. And when we recognize God's image in them, that God loves them like he loves us, that God created them like he created us, that Jesus died for them to save them like Jesus died to save us, it changes how we see people. And if we see people differently, we'll treat them differently. You know, it's hard to be mean to somebody when you realize, hey, God loves them like he loves me. God created them like he created me. God wants to bless them like he wants to bless me. It, it changes the, the approach that we take with people. But it also means I have to break the bad news to you that you are not God's favorite. <laughs> Sorry, I thought about having you tell each other that, but then I'd be like, you're not God's favorite, I am. No, and that's not gonna work. <laughs> See, look, God loves you completely. Totally, he sacrificed Jesus for you, but he doesn't love you more than he loves me. He doesn't love me more than he loves someone else. He loves all of us completely. And, and look, God desires that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So when we recognize people as God's beloved creation, we want to treat them differently. We want to help them succeed. Do not merely look after your own interests, but also the interests of others. 
We want to comfort, you know, uh, them and, and help them heal and find hope to fill their lives. And, and that means that we have to do some really practical things. Like parents, I'm sorry I'm picking on you uh, today, but it means that we have to realize that the other kids in our child's classroom are just as important as our child. Stop asking for favoritism. Okay, I mean, if you want something for your child, you should want it for all the children in the class, not just yours. You know, uh, and, and that means that, in, you know, in your work, our coworkers, you know, seeing them is realizing our coworkers need to feed their families and provide for their families as well. So don't, don't stab them in the back. Don't, you know, don't see them as competition. See them as a mission field. See, if we're going to be kind, we have to see that other people are made in the image of God. And then secondly, if you want to be kind, realize everyone is struggling. Realize everyone hurts. Look, we all live in this broken, sin-filled world. We are all damaged goods, right? We've been damaged by others. We've engaged in some self-destruction. We're damaged by the world that we live in and the random things that happen because sin is, is destroying our lives. We are all broken people who hurt so stop assuming that your pain is worse than everyone else's. Look, I'm just gonna say this. Your pain, your sorrow, your grief, your hurt is real and it is significant and we want you to heal from it. Uh, but you're gonna find healing in kindness towards others and never in glorifying your pain. Let me say that again. You're gonna find healing when you practice kindness towards others instead of glorifying your pain and trying to out, you know, hurt someone else. Because all of us hurt, and all of us are broken, and all of us struggle. Uh, see, we want to share the pain that we have, and we want to glorify God's power to redeem the pain rather than wallow in our misery. So realize everyone is struggling, uh, and that changes the way that you see people. It changes the way you treat people, because they might be having a bad day. They might be uh, getting bad news. They might be hurting just as much or more than you. And then finally... You know, not only do we need to see God's image in people, not only do we realize everyone is struggling, but you need to remember you reap what you sow. I mean, we're going to talk about it in a few weeks uh, when we get to Galatians 6, but uh, the Apostle Paul in verses 7 and 8 says, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. In other words, you can't get away with this. Whatever you sow, that will you reap. If you sow to the Spirit, from the Spirit you're going to reap eternal life. If you sow to the flesh, from the flesh you're going to reap destruction. Okay? That's, that's the way it works. Nobody gets by that. Nobody gets uh, anything else. So uh, let me just ask you a question. Do you want people to be kind to you? Yes. Okay, good. And, and I'm not just talking about just polite because you're paying them money, okay? We want people to be kind. Then show kindness. Be kind. I mean, it's so simple. It's also self-serving, by the way, because if you reap what you sow, then as you are kind to other people, because Jesus said to be kind, because that's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. As you're kind to other people, guess what comes back to you? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you, you kind of get to determine some of how your world looks. Um, now, years ago, I had a friend who was always complaining about conflict everywhere she went. And, and, and I thought it was interesting because we went to the same places, we engaged similar people, and I wasn't having the same conflict. And, and one time I, I just asked her, I said, could it be something you're doing? You know, I was a friend. I just I said, you know, is there something you're doing? And she said, no, people are just jerks. <laughs> Can I just tell you that if your life is filled with constant conflict and mean people, I'm not just talking about like one person that's a, you know, thorn in your flesh. I'm just talking about everywhere you go and everyone you meet, you may want to look in the mirror. You really might want to look in the mirror and see if you're a part of that problem, if you are reaping what you're sowing because we can't escape ourselves. And if you want kindness in your life, be kind. Not, not in moments, but we're talking about kind. Not to just some, but to people everywhere that you go. And, and look, this isn't a natural thing, remember? Because we're selfish creatures, we're sinful creatures. So we have to be intentional and say, God, I want to be kind. Help me to be kind. Help me to see people made in your image. Help me to think about their struggles and, and hurts and maybe even ask and, and help me to remember that I'm gonna reap what I sow. So I just dare you today to elevate your kindness. You know, and, and if you're not sure where you are on that kind of kindness spectrum, 
I dare you to ask the people who know you well. Now, truth is, if you're mean, they're not gonna wanna tell you the truth. So if you can't find anyone who'll be honest with you, that might answer your question. Okay, but, but you know, ask them, hey, what's it like to be on the other side of me? And, and then you could, you know, ask them, do I smile easily? Do I go out of my way to help people? Do you say please and thank you, even at home? Which, if you wanna be kind, practice it at home. Are you someone who has to win every argument? Are you the one who starts every argument? <laughs> and really, honestly, what's it like to be on the other side of you? You see, you may learn some things, but whether you learn anything or not, if you choose to increase your kindness, you're gonna be working in concert with the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit wants to teach us kindness and we cannot represent Jesus unless we reflect his character. My hope and my desire is that people recognize Christ in us because as a church, we go out and we love our community well. We love our neighbors well. We love our families well. And we are known as people who are kind because that is a reflection on Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for being kind to us. We did nothing to deserve your forgiveness, your mercy, your grace. We did nothing to beg you to die on the cross, to pay for our sins. We did nothing to promote the idea that we need your grace and mercy. But you gave it to us simply because you were kind, because you wanted to rescue us from hell. You wanted to adopt us into your family. You wanted to change our lives and fill us with blessings. So God, we thank you. And we commit ourselves to be people who are kind. We invite the Holy Spirit to teach us, to reveal to us the parts of our lives that are unkind, that are selfish, that are arrogant, that are mean. And God, we repent. And we welcome your instruction in our lives. We welcome your correction in our lives because above all else, we want to serve you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Remember, kindness reflects the character of Jesus. It is central to the mission of leading people to a life-changing relationship with Him, and it flows from humility. With so many people focused on themselves, when you show Christ-like kindness to others, it makes an impact. If you'd like to learn more information about the ministry of Calvary, please check out our website, calvaryaz.com. There you'll be able to follow us on social media, listen to or watch past services, and give to support us financially. Well, that's all for today. Please come back next week when we'll be speaking about goodness. Bye-bye.